Good morning, good morning. City Light, it's so good to be with you. My name's Glenn, serve as one of the pastors here. Uh, If you're new with us, a warm welcome to you. Our church exists to multiply Jesus-centered, spirit-led disciples and churches. We're so glad you're here. Um, If you don't know this, we're in the midst of a sermon series in the book of Genesis. And so if you have your Bible or a fake Bible on your device, I want to invite you to turn to Genesis chapter 3. Meet me in Genesis chapter 3. Our normal mode of operation as a church is to preach through books of the Bible. We start in chapter 1, we go till we're done. And here's the thing about Genesis. We're going to be in it for the better part of this year. Without Genesis, you don't have so many things. You don't have the beginning of all truth, and we'd be missing the origin of all things. We wouldn't know a lot about mankind and sin and marriage and government and nature and salvation and languages, so much more. And additionally, we would have no foundation to rest on for the rest of the story of Scripture and for all of human history. So we, what we've done is we've slowed our pacing quite a bit. We preach Genesis chapter 1, the whole thing, Genesis chapter 2, and we're camping in Genesis chapter 3. This is the great pivot of the Bible story because in it we see the fall of mankind. Sin enters into the equation. The scene is really quite tragic. Uh, Everything's perfect and beautiful and good and peaceful. And then because of the temptation of the evil one and then the rebellion of our ancestors, Adam and Eve, uh, there's a lot of aftermath, a lot of aftermath. That continues this morning. And by way of introduction, uh, tell you a story. A couple months ago, my wife Kate and I, we attended a, uh, a party with some couples that are here in our church family, and we played this game called Hive Mind. Anybody played Hive Mind? Yeah, I'd never heard of it either. Um, it's actually really fun. I think we're going to get it. But he, here's the way the game works. You earn points by posing an open-ended question or an unfinished statement to the the group of players you're with. And your goal is to write down a list of answers to that question or that statement that you think would be the most common answer in the room. I heard a couple, "Mm." you can go look it up after this on Amazon. Uh, Okay, one of the questions was in the form of a statement and it was this, life isn't Fill in the blank. Life isn't fill in the blank. I want to just ask you right now to think about how you would finish that. Can you guess the most common answers that were in that room at that party? Uh, Life isn't fair. Got some head nods. Life isn't easy. Life ain't perfect. Perfect. Why do we answer that question that way? Why is that so normal for us to to view our life in that way and to think that we are intelligent and the smart ones to say, life's not fair, it's not butterflies and rainbows? Why? Well, it's because this is our reality. Life isn't easy, life isn't fair. Life isn't perfect. and In fact, many things that entail our experience as human beings on this earth, they're not as they should be. And deep down, we all sense that. There's something in our bones that cries out, this is not the way it was meant to be. Something is very wrong. Something's wrong across the globe in our world. Something is wrong within us. Something's wrong with the human heart. And This morning, we're going to dig into a little bit of that. I've titled this sermon, A Curse and a Promise. A Curse and a Promise. And what I want to do is I want to take you through this text, these few verses, so much to unpack in Genesis chapter 3. And I want to show you from it that the guilt and the corruption that sin brought into our world are quite real. They're true. And they rear their ugly head in our lives to this day. And what sin seems to target, what this corruption seems to to, to be around is is everything, yes, but here's what we're going to see in this text. 
a few things that are essential, central to our flourishing. A few things that were crucial to God's good design in the beginning. Sin breaks, sin stains, sin mars. But then what we're going to do is we're going to look at good news, church. We're going to see this morning that because of Jesus Christ, the righteous one, not only are we forgiven for that sin, but we are actually cleansed from it. The curse of sin, its power, its enslaving grip, its corruption, all of the above, it's ruining our lives, but it's been reversed. The kingdom of God is here. God's rule, God's reign, God's redemption are here. Hope, hope, somebody needs to hear that. Hope is here. Where there was darkness and death because of the person and work of Jesus, there is now light. There is now life and abundant life at that as God's spirit indwells us and empowers us and renews us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So, let me set the context of our text. We, we learned a couple weeks ago the tactics that were used by Satan in the form of a serpent and to breed mistrust in Adam and Eve. And right after they had eaten the fruit of the tree that God had forbidden and warned them against, we saw last week that sin is in the world and, and the man and the woman, they hide from God as if they could. And then they point blame to one another and to Satan taking no ownership or responsibility for what was their fault. Meet me now in Genesis chapter 3. I want us to start in verse 16 as God addresses the woman. Here's what he says. Then he said to the woman, I will sharpen the pain of your pregnancy and in pain you will give birth. I want to stop right there. God's pronouncing a curse not on the man and the woman, but on things in their life. What is a curse? What's a curse? Well, I want to let you know it's not something from a Harry Potter movie. It's not being cussed out, okay? Uh, To be cursed means given over to a corrupted nature, not protected from it not kept from it, not preserved from it, all because of alienation from God. No more friendship with him the way it used to be. No more closeness and intimacy with him the way it used to be. No more fullness of his image and his likeness in us. In the first place, this curse of sin strikes of all the things it could be, church, is pregnancy. Procreation itself is not cursed, but it's the process that now becomes difficult and painful across the globe for millennia. Throughout history, women have always experienced all sorts of complications with fertility and childbirth. We probably don't even sense this fully in our modern American context. The data shows us that today it's 300 times safer to give birth than it was just a few generations ago. Now listen, when it's time to deliver, some of y'all women have said, I don't want the meds, I don't want the epidural, I want to experience the full curse of sin. (laughs) You go, girl. (laughs) Beast mode. But here's the sobering part of this. 17th century uh, author, pastor, Matthew Henry, he comments, he says, the sorrows of childbearing are here multiplied. Not only the travailing throes, but the indispositions before, for its sorrow is from the conception. And the nursing toils and vexations after, and after all, if the children prove wicked and foolish, they are more than ever the heaviness of her that bore them. Here's the point. One of the greatest joys in life now has the potential to be one of life's greatest struggles. You go through all that pain, and then there can still be so much pain ahead. 
And this is the sobering reality of sin's curse. And it's clear that the full scope of mothering has been corrupted. You continue in verse 16. It says, you will desire to control your husband, but he will rule over you. The second part of the corruption of sin has to do with wives. The curse of sin will bring with it a disordering and a dysfunctioning of a woman's relationship with her husband. I know that there are people here in our congregation, people in your life and mine, this hits very close to home. Um, Marriage is struggling, it's on the brink. This is the result of sin. God's good design is for a wife to be a willing follower of her husband's leadership, a helper suitable for him, a companion who compliments him. And now, because of sin, it becomes increasingly difficult for her to willingly submit to him. And the temptation is to make commands and demands of him to keep a tight grip on his decisions and his direction. To be very blunt, church, it's constantly complaining, constantly combative, constantly questioning. I I just want us to listen to the holy wisdom of Proverbs. This is in your Bible. Y'all, I'm just the messenger, okay? About to get some emails. Proverbs 21, 9. It's better to live alone in the corner of an attic than with a quarrelsome wife in a lovely home. (laughs) Proverbs 21, 19. Ten verses later. It's better to live alone in the desert than with a quarrelsome, complaining wife. Four chapters later. Proverbs 25, 24. It's better to live alone in the corner of an attic than with a quarrelsome, wife in a lovely home. Does that sound familiar? That's because that's the first verse I read. We don't even have two John 3.16s in the Bible. We got two of those. There's so many ways that this could be applied. And listen, the Spirit of God, I pray, can minister to you ladies in a personal way that I cannot right now. Here's what I want to say. Give the Spirit of God permission to minister right now, wives in the room, If your husband, in any moment, shows initiative to stand up and lead and shepherd, if he wants to make changes that he feels like honor God, if he wants to open the home more to neighbors, if he wants to take you on a date and ask about how y'all are doing, if he wants to get you a gift, if he wants to pray with you more, if he wants to talk about goals with your children's discipline, if he wants to be more generous, if he wants to get you all to church and in a community with other Christians, if he wants to turn and reference together God's word when you're trying to figure something out and work through something, you don't have to be contentious, quick to question, quick to criticize, quick to belittle or remind him of previous failure, quick to disrespect, quick to get in God's way and quench what could be his spirit, bringing something to life in your husband. So I just want to encourage you, build him up. Express respect for him, encourage him. Lord, let that be true of every marriage in this church. Now, the husbands right now are nodding their heads. Can't wait for the conversation. How do we apply this, dear, in our life after this morning? How do we apply God's word? Pregnancy, wives, number three is husbands. Notice at the end of verse 16, he will rule over you. Now before the fall happened, there was already a creation order that gave husband headship between him and his wife in the home, but now there will often be an inappropriate subjection of the wife by the husband. And what both husband and wife will do is resist the beautiful one flesh relationship that existed right before that in chapter two, before this mess. You know what this means for you, husbands? This means that no longer is it natural to lead your bride like Christ. 
No longer is it natural to be the first to serve. No longer will it come naturally to you to be the first to give, to be the first to confess and repent, to be the first to apologize, to be the first to sacrifice or compromise. This is not in your sin nature. And additionally, look at how God continues and addresses Adam directly in verse 17 to the man. He said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat. Now hold on. I just want to say 95% of the time, listening to your wife, incredibly wise thing to do, okay? You should. But men, it's wrong to listen to your wife when she is constantly contradicting God's word. That's hard to say out loud. But what's happening under the surface there is a catapulting your bride to a place that is above God, on a throne seated on top of him, rather than the other way around. And I want you to know, husbands, God holds the man accountable for the direction of the family. God holds the man accountable for where his wife and his family go. And many Christian men are passive with regard to their family. They don't take responsibility for spiritual leadership in their home. They don't take responsibility to train and discipline their children. They focus on their job, okay, broad brush, and they leave stuff at home to wife and mom, and then when things go wrong there, they blame her. Let me appeal to you in a moment here, just with some data, okay? According to research that was conducted by Promise Keepers, Lifeway Research, Focus on the Family, Get this, if a father does not go to church, but his wife does, one child in 50 will become a worshiper from that home. If a father does go regularly to church, regardless of what the mother does, between two-thirds and three-quarters of their children will be worshipers as adults. If a father attends church irregularly, just sometimes, Between half and two-thirds of their kids will attend church with some regularity as adults. Another survey found that if a child is the first person in a household to become a Christian, and when you read this, God can do anything, but there's a 3.5% probability everyone else in the household will follow. If the mother is the first to become a Christian, there is a 17% probability everyone else in the household will follow. When the father is the first person in a home, to become a born-again Christian. 93% probability. Everyone else in the household will follow. Church, you know how often us pastors meet, oh Lord, guard my tongue, married women who come to church without their husband because he's sleeping in, he is tinkering with a project at home, Um, that's her thing, not his. I'm tired of meeting families over the last 10 years in the local church who inevitably disconnect and stop pursuing Jesus because the man just doesn't want to, or even worse, the wife doesn't want to, and the man thinks, happy wife, happy life. Boy, have you lost your mind. This is not God's design. This isn't his plan for us. Instead, there is a beautiful way that God has designed us to operate and we have an incredible privilege as men to guard and protect and steward and shepherd our families as loving servants, as sacrificial leaders. And the best thing we can do is not in and of ourselves, it's to expose our wife and our children to King Jesus. It's to get them in the midst of his people. It's to get them in front of his precious word It's to get them into ongoing, interactive relationship with him, personal friendship with him. What a gift God has given us. Sin seeks to corrupt that. Here's the point of all these statistics, as flawed and as 
subjective as they may be, a man's impact on his family is huge. It's huge. Um, I want to just do something by way of encouragement. I want to tell you a story from my own journey. Uh, Kate and I were married in 2015. So the first few years, I've I've confessed this before, of marriage, we had uh, a good marriage, but there were just a lot of hot moments where anger, bitterness, rivalry, conflict would just erupt. And I was a very, very angry man. Um, I was doing ministry in the local church. I was teaching God's word. Uh, I was called to be a a model of what it means to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control. And there were a lot of moments my wife did not experience me that way. It seemed as though I would coast through a month or two doing just fine and then something would happen between us where my anger would boil over and and result in shouting and result in saying things that I wish I could take back. And then I, I would retreat and, you know, find God and get some counsel and then I'd be fine for another few months and then we'd come back to that situation. And that just seemed to be the cycle that I was in. Additionally, I would uh, come home and I'd be exhausted because I was with people all day, talking with people, counseling people, praying with people, going to strangers on the college campus and sharing the gospel with people. And so I'd come home and I didn't want to be around people. So my wife would experience me as shut down, robotic. Um, She did not get my best. Now, I tell you that because there are many people in this room who uh, marriage right now is a struggle. And there are habits and uh, things that have just cycled over and over again and been a part of your marriage for a long time. And maybe you've just kind of become used to that. You've tried to just settle that this is the way it's going to be. Maybe quietly you're struggling to stay married. You're fighting that fight right now. I I just want to bring the best encouragement I can give in Isaiah chapter 53 verses 4 and 5 this is what's prophesied of Jesus surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering speaking of the cross that word pain that word suffering is not just physical although it is it's emotional It's spiritual. It's mental. And here's what it says. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our sin. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And here's here's the, the verse. By his wounds we are healed. That word healed is a word that signals shalom. It's a word that brings wholeness. It's a word that brings inner peace, inner contentment, inner solace. And it's a word that almost makes it feel like you can be untouchable by every trial and tribulation that life brings you. This is a gift that Jesus purchased for us. And God can take every bit of all of our suffering, all of our pain, all of our sin, whether we've committed it or it's been committed against us, and he and only he can use it to bring healing to us. It seems paradoxical, but you tell me, when have you felt most worshipful, most in touch with heavenly realities, most close to God. It's hardly ever when things are going perfectly. It's when you are in the valley. Things are going very poorly. Life sucks. It's hard, it's painful, it's difficult. You want to give up? Right there in that season, Christian, I just want to encourage you. God is working. He is healing. 
This is his heart and his will toward you. And to get very practical with you, here's what we do. We tend to seek him only reactively. We tend to pursue God only when things hit the fan rather than proactively. And here's what I want to press in, church. These concepts and this verse do not heal you. God heals you. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is no person that you can meet with who can heal you. There's no tool that any counselor can give you that can heal you. It doesn't have the power to do that. There's one person that can bring healing to your soul. It's God himself. There is no church. There is no ministry. There is no book. There's no words of wisdom from a friend that can heal you. They're all meant to point you to the one who can heal you. Jesus himself is healer. He would delight for you to know him that much more that way. But it has to come in intimate, private, one-on-one. God, I surrender to you. Nothing else matters. I'm all yours, God. And he can bring healing. Only God can heal. No meeting, no ministry, no sermon has hope unless it's with Jesus. With Jesus, you can have hope. Now, it's so hard for me to move on here because I feel like that's where I want to camp, right? But the text continues to move us into something that I think is God's grace to us because there are many people in the room who aren't married. And there's also something in our life that's very essential to our human flourishing that sometimes we just kind of forget is a huge part of our life, and that is work. Work, our job. So I want to continue Genesis chapter 3, starting in the second half of verse 17. The ground is cursed because of you, speaking to Adam. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Uh, Let's talk about work. Can we all give a collective sigh? (laughs) Uh, Many of you have to go back to work tomorrow. Some of you are like, Pastor, I... I come here to escape work. I don't want to talk about that right now. Um, Let let me just say it like it is. The world, our sinful nature, and the devil preach a message that says pour yourself out at work. Worship it, bow down to it, and when you come home with nothing in your tank, you're short with your kids, you're irritated with your spouse, everyone needs to empathize with you and your exhaustion and your frustration because work did it to you. And sometimes work, rather than helping people flourish, oftentimes work exploits people. Oftentimes work, it assaults people's dignity. Um, It keeps bringing up the expected output. I mean, I spend time with men in our church. This is like, how are you doing? Every single week, like this is the thing that they're struggling with. There's just more expected of them and not enough time in the day And somehow all their means of production to get to that end have been made more difficult by their boss or their situation. We live in a world where sometimes employees aren't seen as people, but they're seen as numbers on a balance sheet. My bride works as an actuary and constantly moving and shifting and people over here and people now doing this role and people leaving. and And it just feels like there's never any stability There's fatigue from work. There's a lot of false motives and mistrust in work. I mean, I can just go on and on and on. Work is affected by the fall. Can I get an amen? Amen. (laughs) It is. But work is a good thing, church. Work, putting your hand to the plow and working on something, productivity, industry, were there before the fall. Work is a good thing designed by a good God blesses us. And so here's what I want to do. I want to work through a few quick things with you to just help you understand, Christian. God has redeemed work. Sin seeks to corrupt it and take it and steal it from us, but God 
brings redemption to work. And here's a few of the ways he does that. Work is a means of God's provision. Uh, Work is a component of our service and our worship. It's one of God's instruments to get the things done that he wants done. Um, Work provides for us. It feeds us. It gives us education. It enables us to enjoy things that God gives as good gifts. Work gives us the opportunity to give God praise for doing something in the way that he has made us. Number two, work is an essential part of our humanity. This is really, really cool. In John chapter 5, verse 17, Jesus says, my father is always working and so am I. Our God is a working God. He's a creating God. We just read and studied Genesis chapter 1 a few weeks ago. Nobody creates like God creates. And among many traits, that is one that we reflect as his image bearers. Being made in the image of God, it gives all of us inherent worth and dignity. Yes, amen. But it means that our work and our creativity can be God-glorifying, God-honoring, God-reflecting. You know what else work is? Some of you grieve work. Let me tell you something else that work is. Work is one of the greatest ways that we obey Jesus' second commandment. Love your neighbor as yourself. Work when done with integrity, when done with excellence, when someone approaches work with a great work ethic and character, it helps communities flourish. It it benefits and blesses people that you will never, ever meet. Colossians chapter 3, 23 and 24, Paul says, work willingly at whatever you do as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. Remember that the Lord will give you an inheritance as your reward and that the master you are serving is Christ. Work is also preparation for eternity. It's preparation for eternity. Sadly, uh, when we think of heaven, what do we think of often? Uh, Clouds and harps and little angels and cupids and we're just gonna be singing one hymn over and over and over again. And listen, God would be worthy of that, but heaven is not just this eternal place our soul sits and in the sky. The future kingdom of God will be even more real than this fallen world that we live in, and our lives are only preparing us for that. How? Let me just say this. There's really good news. If you're a worker in here, the kingdom of God is here. It dawned in Christ, and when Jesus returns again, he will fully consummate all things to himself. So what that means is that all of our giftings, all of our talents, all of the things we happen to be very good at in our job, all of our duties, they will carry on into the new Jerusalem, the new heavens, the new earth, where we will rule and we will reign with God forever. This is a preparation for eternity. What you do and how you go about your work right now is significant Work is discipleship. When most of us think about discipleship, we think, what Bible studies does City Light Bennington give us to study through? What spiritual disciplines do I pick up and take up in my life? And to be honest, work is something that takes up so much of our life, and it's an essential part of our growing in Christ. Given how intimately work is embedded into our identity as as image bearers of God and um, just our life and how we plan our rhythms and all of the above, we should think about our work as part of being a follower of Jesus. What character is it producing? What wisdom is it producing? What prudence is it producing in us? Lastly, work is a missionary opportunity. Um, A lot of mission research reveals that the key element in most people's conversion to Jesus is relationship with another person. Uh, In the workplace, you have relationships, and you have a lot of them. The average Christian knows 50 non-Christians. And in the workplace, Christians spend a lot of time with people who are not followers of Jesus. I know this can kind of escape us sometimes, but we will spend more time with people that we work with than we do some of our best friends. We'll spend more time on the job with coworkers and employees and employers that are from all sorts of different backgrounds, ethnic backgrounds, age groups, that we just don't experience in our leisure time. 
And in the workplace, people can see the difference that Jesus makes in your life because pay attention, everything's the same for you and that other person. (laughs) The, The boss you're under, the, the workplace culture, the, the corporate atmosphere, all the pressures and stresses and the email that just got sent down that everyone's grieving. It's all the same. The only difference is Jesus in you. And the witness you have is how you respond in those situations. Will you give way to panic and stress and anger? Or will you have peace? Will you join in on the slander and the gossip? Or will God control your tongue there's a million questions to be asked there but the way we approach our work and the excellence with which we conduct ourselves the the holiness with which the spirit of God manifests himself through us at our job it makes a huge huge difference Matthew 13 33 this is amazing Jesus used this illustration the kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour it permeated every part of the dough. God intends, church, for us to be influential wherever we are. He gives us authority and power and his very spirit to lead us wherever we are to point to Jesus. Work is a missionary opportunity. So let me just ask this question. How are you doing with work? Did you know that your job was targeted directly in Genesis chapter three to be corrupted by the fall? Sin's curse is there. Did you know that God has made a way for you to enjoy your job differently, to experience your job differently, to approach your job differently? What a great opportunity a job is for stewardship. What a terrible, terrible master our job is to us. Amen? So, uh, do you have the courage, do we have the courage to protect the things that are most important in our life? Our marriage, our family, our friendships, our own growth in Christ against all of the things that pull strings in work. Um, The last thing that we see that is really the, the biggest thing is in verse 19, from dust you were made and from to dust you will return. Y'all, this is the introduction of death. Death is a result of the fall, and so many tears have been wept throughout the centuries over lost life. It hits very close to home for many people here. It wasn't supposed to be this way, this great cloud of mortality and sin that we live under. I just wonder, after all this preaching this morning, church, do you feel the weight of sin? Can you still say, no, it's not got a hold of my life? No, it's not a part of our reality. How can you? It's hard and sobering to accept it, but I want to bring good news this morning. Church, I want to bring good news right here in this chapter. Yes, there are curses. There is a promise. There is a promise from God. In Genesis 3, 14, jumping back up, when God addresses the serpent, he says, because you have done this, you are cursed more than all animals, domestic and wild. You will crawl on your belly, groveling in the dust as long as you live. To be in the dirt is a sign of judgment in Scripture. He's looking at Satan. He's saying, you're going to be on your belly. You've gone from the highest place in heaven to the lowest place on earth. It leaves no doubt. Listen, snakes on a plane. It wasn't called rabbits on a plane, okay? Snakes. Like my, okay, my dad and I, we're driving. There's a snake in the road. Years ago, we drove over it. We said, you know what? Let's be public servants. Back up and go over it again, okay? (laughs) Some of you, you're going to go home and someone's going to ask you, what did you learn from today's sermon? Snakes are bad. Snakes are bad, okay? But listen, here's what I want you to see in this text. The next verse, God says something that we, we skip over or we misinterpret. Verse 15, I will cause hostility between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. Hostility, enmity, hatred, The Christian life itself is described as a battle. Y'all, we have to fight a fight, do we not, to follow Jesus? It's a a war. This is where spiritual warfare is introduced, and I just want to tell you a quick story. Uh, Professor, author, Ligon Duncan, he tells this story about a farmer. And this farmer was known across his town as being really, really aggressive, stubborn, abusive, 
prideful. Uh, He was known as someone who berated his workers. He was horrible to his own cattle and livestock. Uh, He verbally abused his wife. Uh, He was a dark, dark man. All the community knew it until a gospel revival came to their town. This man heard the gospel. The Spirit of God worked in his heart. He repented of his sin. He bowed down to Jesus. And you would not believe how this man changed. All of a sudden, everyone in town is no longer talking about this man as an example of sin and darkness. They're looking at this man and saying, look what God has done. He's sweet and kind to his wife. He treats his employees, his cattle, his livestock with tenderness. When was the last time any of us saw him burst out in rage or anger? And so here's what happened, church. It's not the end of the story. A month passes. And there's an occasion with his wife present where the man breaks out in rage and he goes right back to square one. He has a night where he gives himself to who he once was. He's horrible to his his workers, horrible to his bride, horrible to his cattle. And he comes in and he throws himself on the kitchen table after he's run to the house and he breaks down in tears and he began, he began to explain to his wife, nothing ever changed. God didn't actually do something in my life. I'm not actually different than I once was. And the wife says, oh no, my dear, there is all the difference in the world. Because you would do this before with not the slightest tinge of remorse. You would do this before with no repentance. And now, look at you. Your heart is broken over the behavior, over the sin that is in you. What we learn from this is that in this farmer, there was a new principle of life in him. There could no longer be satisfaction that came with walking in darkness. And Christians, Jesus has transferred us into the kingdom of his light. Um, What I want to encourage you with here is that if you are experiencing this kind of battle, if you are going back and reverting to old ways, if you, Christian, are saying, I haven't actually changed that much, I need you to know this morning that God put enmity between you and between the evil one. There is a protective wedge and barrier that exists there And the signs of spiritual warfare within us are the very evidence of life and grace that the Holy Spirit of God brings. Take heart, Christian. You are feeling grief that's godly. You don't want to be alienated from God and you know your sin creates a separation there. This is a good, good sign. I want to close this morning with Genesis 3.15 where the promise is given, he, capital H, will strike or crush your head and you will strike his heel. This is a picture of God saying there's good news 2,000 years before it would come to fruition. This is God ruining the schemes and the work of the evil one before they've even begun. This is God saying, Jesus is coming. And before we conclude this morning, I want us to understand the full scope of this. In Romans chapter 8, Paul writes this, yet what we suffer now is nothing compared to the glory he will reveal to us later. All creation is waiting eagerly eagerly for that future day when God will reveal who his children really are. Against its will, all creation was subjected to God's curse. Not just marriage, not just work, not just motherhood, all creation, everything in our world subjected to this curse. This is an all-encompassing curse. Sin corrupts everything. And this is our present reality, but there's so much hope. Because church, listen to the remainder of this passage. With eager hope, the creation looks forward to the day when it will join God's children in glorious freedom from death and decay. We know that all creation 
has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. And we believers also groan, even though we have the Holy Spirit within us as a foretaste of future glory. For we long for our bodies to be released from what? Sin and suffering. We too wait with eager hope for the day when God will give us our full rights as his adopted children, including the new bodies he has promised us. We were given this hope when we were saved. Galatians 3.13 says, But Christ has rescued us from the curse pronounced by the law. When he was hung on the cross, he took upon himself the curse for our wrongdoing. For it is written in the scriptures, cursed is everyone who hung on a tree. Right now, City Light Bennington, right now, Jesus is making all things new. Right now, Jesus can actually, you sitting right there in your chair, bored or excited as you may be from this sermon, Jesus can change your reality. Jesus, only Jesus, can bring his spirit alive in you. There can be new life in you where there was death and decay. There can be freedom brought to you that you can actually walk in instead of being enslaved to the corruption of sin. Step by step, day by day, God can actually bring liberation to you. Step by step, day by day, the script of your life as it's been written so far, the script of your job as it's been written so far, the script of your marriage as it's been written so far does not have to continue. Today, right now, God can begin, if you would let him, to make changes in your heart, to kill sin and its corruption in your soul. To make you a new person with new desires, a new vision for your life, new hope, new power, new contentment. Only Jesus Christ can do this. If you're not a Christian in the room, I want to let you know, God is eager to forgive the guilt of sin in your life. This is why he sent Jesus to atone for it on the cross, to make a way for you to be clean and righteous in his sight. He can also make you a new creation. Scripture tells us, behold, the old has gone, the new has come. By faith in Jesus, church, God doesn't take us from religious people who do a few bad things here and there to being a person who makes some better decisions in our life and has a little bit more aura of wisdom about us. God takes a dead person stuck, enslaved in their sin, and he brings actual freedom like nothing else in this world can bring. He brings life, abundant life. So I want to pray for our church right now, and I want to pray that at City Light Bennington, in this community, in this region, this would be a place where increasingly the grip of sin, the curse of sin, is not felt. So I want you to join with me in prayer. God, right now we ask, in mothering, in marriage, in work, over death itself, Jesus, bring freedom. Bring newness, we pray. God, I'm asking right now that this would be a beacon of hope in this community. I'm asking right now that in small, personal ways, God, in homes today, today, conversations would be had, repentance would be had, healing would happen. It is impossible to please you without faith, so I am praying for an increase of faith where there has been faithlessness in the room this morning. God, minister to your people, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.